the session is being recorded. I see we have uh, at least nine people on who are participating. And I know Peggy would take some time to uh, give some recognition for the people that make this happening, all of our sponsors who are appreciated. We're appreciative of that. And thank you all for signing on this evening. We're picking up our series, the what I call the last of the gatekeepers, that generation of women and men who were in uniform or anybody in our national security establishment who stood guard, who stood watch over the United States from 1975 to 1990, essentially from Vietnam to the end of the Cold War. So I think I still have the ability to share a screen. I do. We'll go ahead and get started. I'm, I'm entitling this, or I've entitled this, The Conundrum of Berlin, because Berlin was one of two major points during the Cold War. Berlin has been important throughout uh, modern European and modern American history for so many reasons, particularly with the arrival of the 20th century. Berlin, of course, being that, that capital of Germany during World War I, Berlin being that capital of the Nazis during World War II, Berlin being that focal point for a lot of spy activity and so much tension during the Cold War. So there hasn't really been a time <laughs> in recent history where Berlin, where Berlin has not been important to include today. Germany is a very well-respected and very, very cherished ally. And to think about how their relationship ch changed so quickly after World War I is a testament to not just the fast moving nature of foreign policy in human beings, but just the fact that Berlin and Germany, situated as they are in central Germany, are a fulcrum point upon which so many things that have happened in Europe required the inclusion of or caused by or were affected by Germany. And I call this the conundrum of Berlin is because so often questions about American foreign policy and what was going to happen to the United States and its allies during the Cold War had to do with resolving the question, what do we do with Berlin? How should we perceive Berlin? How do we administer Berlin? So let's go ahead and get into that and look at those questions and how Berlin symbolized both its own issue during the Cold War, but also Berlin also symbolized the larger reality of the Cold War in its global sense on all fronts of that war. Thus, the Cold War from 1945 forward was the constant overshadowing reality for many people, all people around the world, particularly for people in the Soviet Union and the United States. This is a map of Cold War Europe in 1950. And you can see, according to the legend of the map, the NATO countries in green and those nations that were occupied by the Warsaw Pact in purple. And you'll notice that most of the nations that are covered in purple, obviously the Soviet Union, meaning, meaning Russia, but let's look also at the nations that were included in that Warsaw Pact, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. You will note that the country of Yugoslavia is neutral. It's because even though Marshal Tito, his actual name was Josip Broz, B-R-O-Z, he was known internationally as Marshal Tito, even though he was a communist, and he definitely was a communist, he chose to Somehow he managed to stay beyond the control of the orbit in Moscow. So yes, he's a communist, but he still managed to maintain Yugoslavian independence. Now, the thing to also know about Yugoslavia was that Yugoslavia was a conglomeration of many smaller states that after the, after the fall of Berlin, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Cold War ended, Yugoslavia would have a bunch of small states that, that would declare independence Serbia, Croatia, but the, the tensions that had caused those states to go to war with each other or to be at odds with each other before World War I, those tensions never did go away and they would flare up and produce the Balkans Wars of the early 1990s. I'm working with a student right now who's from that area and she took a trip back to the area just about maybe a few years ago, obviously before the pandemic and there are Muslim students, I mean, she's Muslim from Bosnia, a good number of Bosnians from, a good number of Muslims in Bosnia, and she has these vivid memories of 
how Muslims were rounded up and put in concentration camps. So you're talking about here it was in the early 1990s where another situation with concentration camps, camps and genocide was being committed in Europe yet again in the same century, a mere 45, 50 years after the first big horrific one. If you include, well, add that to the Armenian genocide of World War I. When you take a look at Germany, from that map that we saw before, this is Cold War Europe, and this specifically, this is Cold War Germany. Take a look at it. You see Germany was divided into the red, the Russian zone, the green was the British zone, the blue was the French zone, the orange was the American zone. And you'll notice that deep inside, deep, deep, deep inside of the red zone, where you see also, again, the red, the blue, the green, and the orange color, that was the city of Berlin. So just as the nation of Germany was divided between the Russians, the British, the French, and the Americans, likewise, Berlin, inside of the Russian zone, was, was divided between the British, the French, the Russians, and the Americans. A closer examination shows us how Berlin, the city, was divided between East Berlin and West Berlin. And you'll see from that legend, the hard, the very thick orange line, where you find Checkpoint Charlie right there, that's where the Berlin Wall was built. Why would they, why would they build a Berlin Wall? Well, the Berlin Wall was built in 1961. But 14 years before then, 13, 14 years before then, the world got a close up and personal view of just what it meant to be on the Eastern side of Soviet domination. In other words, to be allied with the, to be in the East, to be in the control of the communists, the German communists, the, who were controlled by the communists from Russia, who were controlled by Moscow. Because in 1947, 1948, the Russians cut off access to West Berlin. If we go back to that map, or just look in the, uh, the insect, if in fact, you see here, you see that Berlin is deep inside of the Soviet zone. The Russians essentially blocked off road traffic to Berlin so that the French, the Americans and the British could not get to their sectors of Berlin. So what that necessitated was that it was, a, it was an international diplomatic dispute. There were people escaping from East Germany and East Berlin into the Western sector. So to stop that, the Russians cut off access. Well, what were the Americans and the British and the French supposed, supposed to do? The Russians did this to punish the people who were escaping into the Western sector. The Americans were not gonna back down. So what they did instead was in 1947, 1948, they initiated something called the Berlin Airlift for the next year, for the next year, there were round the clock flights flying from the, West Germany into West Berlin, food, fuel, clothing, whatever people needed to survive. This went on for a full year and the world had an opportunity to see just how far Joseph Stalin and the Soviets were willing to go to make people bend to their will. It was in a more modern sense, a public relations disaster, but it set up a clear understanding that the Cold War was gonna be a long-term hostile, tense confrontation, and it would require everywhere the Soviets moved, the Americans would have to move and counter that move. And you couldn't afford to underestimate what they were willing to do. Likewise, by 1961, when the Berlin Wall was built, the East Germans were still tired and their masters in Moscow were frustrated with the fact that people were still escaping into the West. So they built a wall. And you see right here, this is a more dynamic expression of the wall or, or, the, or illustration of how that wall was built. All, the, all of those miles of wall to keep people in. You know, generally speaking, when we build fences or walls, it's to keep, it's to keep a menace or a threat out. But when you have to build something to keep people in, that means that you are either have a system that is so oppressive people want to escape, or it's a prison, which for the prisoners, I guess, is, is oppressive and they want to escape. 
Either way, it's always a larger commentary, larger negative commentary upon the people who are trying to keep the people in as opposed to the people who are trying to get out. People in East Germany wanted to be free. So please bear with me as I read here for a moment. During the early Cold War, West Berlin was a geographic loophole through which thousands, stay with me, thousands of East Germans fled to the democratic West. So communist East German authorities built a wall that encircled West Berlin. It was thrown up overnight, figuratively speaking on August 13th, 1961. From 1961 for the next three decades, the city became the hot end of the Cold War as the nuclear superpowers glared across the wall. Let me give some, some, some further context to that. There were incidents at the Berlin Wall, of course. People escaped across or attempted to escape across the Berlin Wall, of course. Spy novels, John Le Carre and his spy novels comes to mind for what he wrote and every now and then mentioning the, Ber the Berlin Wall. But more than just being a symbol of communism, more than being a symbol of Soviet domination, the Berlin Wall came to symbolize in its own way, not just the physical literal division between East Germany and West Germany or East Berlin and West Berlin, the Berlin Wall came to symbolize the division ideologically, economically, culturally, militarily between East and West, America and the NATO allies and the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies. So stay with me. There's the physical Berlin Wall and what it means for the physical separation of people, but then there's what the Berlin Wall meant. It meant and what it symbolized. It symbolized the division between freedom and slavery communism and capitalism, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of movement, all the things that people in the West, people in the United States cherish as just their assumed rights. And conversely, it symbolized for people beyond that, behind that wall, the lack of freedom that they had, the lack of free speech, the lack of movement, the lack of opportunity, the lack of every freedom that every human being has ever wanted. The wall came to symbolize that. And the Cold War, whenever there was something going on, whether it was Korea, whether it was Vietnam, everything that the communists did sooner or later is very easy to tie it right back to the wall as the symbol of that conflict and the oppression that went along with it. These are pictures of the, of the Germans building the wall. And as we indicated, the wall was built rapidly. And of course it was updated, reinforced, you see them here putting the bricks in place. A German soldier or a policeman standing there at the wall being built. And then eventually there came the checkpoints, the barbed wire. I mean, this was a very complex network of checkpoints, guard towers, machine gun emplacements. And obviously, you see here, this picture right here, of people standing behind the wall looking at an East German soldier on the eastern side of the wall. And look at the crowd of people on the left, the people in West Germany who just are there to look across this wall, how surreal it must have been that people would line up to look across and see the desolation, the poverty, the despair represented by that wall on the other side to be that close to ideological and democratic disaster or should I say lack of democratic disaster, be exemplified by the communist disaster. And so there it was. Life along the wall, on both sides of the wall, this became, like I said, the focal point, the symbol, the center of all that was either right or wrong about the Cold War. And you see here, children playing along the wall. A generation that grows up with the wall, their reality is this wall and the barbed wire and the guard towers and the machine guns. Did people try to escape across the wall? Absolutely, they did. This is a picture of a person named Peter Fechter, who in 1962, August 17, 1962, was shot dead while attempting to, across, to cross the Berlin Wall. 
we sometimes forget it's been so long now, over 30, 40 years, we tend to forget that the people trying to get across the wall, escaping the wall, they absolutely would have been shot down and were shot down, hence Peter Fector. But there were others who attempted to escape across the wall who actually made it. Like this gentleman. Well, this is Peter Fector here too. But there was one German soldier named Hans Conrad Schumann, who famously defected to West Germany during the construction of the Berlin Wall. Now, Hans Conrad Schumann was a German soldier. And when the wall was being built in 1961, he waited and took his moment, found his moment, and he literally jumped across the wall while it was being constructed. I have a brief video I'd like to share with you all to show that. Here we go. I'd like to show you all that last that last section because Hans Conrad Schumann, the part where they show him jumping over the wall, it occurs so fast, which just goes to show how absolutely efficient his timing was in making that move. Let's take a brief look at that again. So Hans Conrad Schumann defected to West Germany. And I don't know about you, but I, when, I first, when I first dove into this information, to learn that Hans Conrad Schumann committed suicide in 1998, the first question that came into my mind was why? And then when I found out the answer, I said, of course, of course, that, of course he would have been depressed. Of course he would have been lonely. Of course he would have been isolated. When Hans Conrad Schumann, this is, this is the statue that was eventually made of him 
to symbolize, to show his act of heroism. And, you know, Hans, Hans Conrad Schumann, like many people who just do something because it's natural for them to do it, for them it's a small thing, he just wanted to be free. So he, he, he jumped over a wall. Well, jumping over what became the Berlin Wall is a pretty big deal. But for him that day, he becomes this international symbol of heroism and freedom and inspiration. He's just trying to be a free man to live without people dominating his life. So he got instant, some instant recognition. But for the next few years while living in West Germany, Hans Conrad Schumann was sent notes and harassed by the Stasi and the communists, threatening him, threatening to do things to his family. This is what we need to remember. When he escaped, he left behind family and friends. He left behind a life, even a life under the communists. Still, he had a life there. It was a, it, it clearly was, must have been a miserable life because he wanted to escape it and he did. But then he comes to international fame and that same fame, what it is, it's a black mark against the Soviet Union. It's a black mark against Germany, East Germany. It's a black mark against the Stasi. It's a black mark against the whole enterprise of communism that people wanted to broadcast or advertise as the workers paradise. If it's such a paradise, why would this man risk everything to get away from it? So Hans Conrad Schumann spent decades depressed and alone and worried about his friends and family who were harassed. And eventually, this is him as he got older, a picture of his famous leap across the wall. And eventually, the mental stress claimed his life. Berlin is the focal point. Berlin is the fulcrum around which so many confrontations occurred during the Cold War. The, the actual fulcrum, the symbolic fulcrum, the conundrum of Berlin, what it meant. The confusing thing is there. We know about it. We want to do something about it. But what do you do with Berlin, which is so deep inside the Soviet zone? All you can do is endure it and tolerate it and work around it as best you can. What you're doing, is it making things worse? Is it making things better? Some days yes, some days no, maybe never. The conundrum, the question mark. How do you actually resolve the issue of Berlin or do you never resolve it? And because you could not directly deal with Berlin, because Berlin came to symbolize the larger Cold War and the, and the, and the Berlin Wall came to symbolize the divisions of every kind in the Cold War. <clears throat> You have to fight the Cold War in different areas on different fronts. For example, we discussed, we've already discussed in our series that there was one front where the Cold War was being fought that involved the, the Caribbean. We mentioned last week about Daniel Ortega, Maurice Bishop in the center there, and Fidel Whoa. Castro. Hey. And eventually how are you? what happened Good. How are you? on August 25th, 1988, That's with right. Operation yeah. Urgent oh. Fury. It's um the US Marines and <laughs> Army Rangers invading and Grenada and Grady. to get rid of the communists there who had built, who had built a, a landing field, yeah. landing strip for yeah, being built by the Cubans. Uh -huh. And we didn't know what they were gonna do with that. But the fact that it was in the Caribbean again and that Castro was in the Caribbean was enough for American military planning. Another shifting front of consideration no. involved Central Asia. We talked about the last time that the Cold War also had to deal with rising tensions in other parts of the world that we hadn't been paying attention to all that much before the Cold War. In this case, in 1980, when the Iranians and the Iraqis started fighting each other and what became known as the Iran- So where are you going now? Just put this downstairs for you. Okay, then what? I don't know, then I gotta go home and sew. The Iran-Iraq War was what many people uh, called the Middle Eastern or the, the World War I that happened in Central Asia or the Middle East. Take it for your kids. Okay. And, and on the stove, you will set my clock. And also, Girl, and on the stove, oh, can you there's the latest- Please uh, mute your microphone. Burl, can you please mute your microphone? Okay. As is everything. Okay. Burl, can you please mute your microphone? All these. Do you want it? Probably not. Girl, can you please mute your microphone? I'll mute it, Donna. Okay. Put it up there for you. 
Right, I'll put it in the refrigerator, but you'll have to heat it up. It's hot now. I don't, I'll have to, why? To I apologize, up. everyone. You're I got booted out. And I'm just trying to log back in. Yeah, so as soon as I log right. back in, I will mute Merle. Okay, that's wonderful. Okay, and then a week from today. It's the, it's the wonderful world of 21st century technology, you all. Huh? And now there's always a few little glitches that happen, yeah, and I apologize. It's just connecting. Let me be back in as mom. I like I like to I like to recommend to everybody a movie titled Heartbreak Ridge. I thought you were going with it starts Clint, Clint Eastwood. Uh -huh. And in that movie, Clint Eastwood uh -huh. was playing a grizzled a grizzled Marine okay. Corps well, whatever. senior non-commissioned officer. And one thing that he says all the time, for every problem, for every problem that he meets, Clint Eastwood says, we're going to improvise, adapt, and overcome. So we're going to improvise, and adapt, adapt, and overcome. We should be good. OK, we have improvised, we have adapted, and we're overcoming. 1984. Yes, we are. <laughs> 1984 was an election year. Let me go back. To, let me go back just a few slides. The, one of the shifting fronts that American policymakers and that the United States had to contend with, had to be concerned with. Listen, it's not that we couldn't do anything about Berlin, but what do you do? What do you do about Berlin? It's a divided city. It's deep inside the Russian sector. The only way you're going to do something about Berlin, if you want, if you want to take over Berlin, that's a military confrontation. During the Cold War, it was generally understood, at least as the way it was taught to me in the Marine Corps. If you were gonna, the, the Russians, according to American doctrine, what we understood a Russian doctrine, the Russians, if they decided to attack in Europe, the, the first through point obviously would be Berlin. So that was never an option to avoid World War III unless you just wanted to have World War III. The other possible invasion route into Western Europe was through Norway. I'll talk about, about that by telling you all a very brief story from my own personal experience in the military about how that became important. But other fronts that we had to contend with during the Cold War, we mentioned the Iran-Iraq War and how that, that started in the, the early 1980s. 1984 was an election year. President Reagan won that election with George H.W. Bush, the senior Bush as his vice president, so that began their second term in office. The Democratic nominee that year, or for the, the Democrats was Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro. As you can see here, four more years, 1984. Another front that people, we had to contend with during the Cold War had to deal with Northern Africa. We mentioned all these other things. We, all these other fronts were preoccupying or gathered American attention, but all the while, Berlin was there in the background. We mentioned that in the 1980s, Muammar Gaddafi and his agents, Muammar Gaddafi gave the green light for his agents to stage an attack upon an American a, a nightclub in West Berlin that killed a bunch of American soldiers off duty and some German civilians. And the response was that, you see here, the New York Times article stated that it was two killed, 155 hurt in a bomb explosion at a club in Berlin. President Reagan dispatched F-111s to stage an attack upon Tripoli, Libya, against Muammar Gaddafi himself. It was called Operation El Dorado Canyon. Reagan said later on, that the airstrikes on Monday night near Tripoli and Benghazi were a single engagement in a long battle against terrorism. This was the new reality, the old new reality and the new old reality. Terrorism has been with us for a long, long time. We are so accustomed to hearing about it in our time, but don't forget that it was, it was an act of terrorism by, Gravi, by Gavrilo Princip at Sarajevo, in the summer of 1914, that was the first spark that lit what eventually became the, the confrontation, the bomb that became World War I by killing Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophia. From that one act of terrorism, he belonged to a, an organization called the Black Hand or also known as the Union of Death. So terrorism has been around for a while, but now 
terrorism, along with the worries about the Soviets, terrorism is coming from different spots around the world. In America, it seems like the global front is happening everywhere. Central Asia, Europe, obviously, the Caribbean, South America. And as I mentioned, along with, those, along with all those new areas to be concerned about, there was still the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. Here in this image, you see President John F. Kennedy and Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev. And always, Berlin, every now and then, would just come up over and over and over again as a focal point where differences between East and West sometimes crystallize with confrontations or worries or convergencies at Berlin. The global front of the Cold War, also symbolized by the divisions of Berlin, also pertain to the African continent. You see here that Africa, a, formerly, a continent formerly colonized, except for Ethiopia, except for Liberia and Ethiopia, but even Ethiopia was eventually colonized by the Italians. Africa, up until the mid, mid 20th century, was pretty much dominated by European powers. But with the advent of World War II, and at the end of World War II, the divisions in Europe that also showed up with divisions in the Caribbean, that also showed up with divisions in South America, that showed up in divisions in Asia, also showed up with divisions and words about communist influence in Africa, particularly in what was called the Congo. You see right here in the left panel, the, the, left, the left image, the only, to my knowledge, democratically elected prime minister of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba wanted to get the, the Belgians, their colonizers out, completely removed from his country. And he sought assistance from the West and was rebuffed. And being rebuffed, he then turned around and sought assistance from the East meaning the Soviet Union and its communist allies. This is happening in 19, the late 1950s, early 1960s. Dwight D. Eisenhower was still in office as he's getting close to the end of his term. Dwight D. Eisenhower, who had been bamboozled and left enraged and frustrated because he had given the green light to assist Fidel Castro in getting, in getting rid of Fulgencio Batista. And then of course, Castro pulled a double cross on the Americans and then put his arm around, became chummy with the Soviets. Dwight Eisenhower was committed to not having that happen again on his watch. And when it appeared that Patrice Lumumba was going to cozy up to the Soviets, like Castro had done, Patrice Lumumba had to be removed. And he was. He was eventually arrested by American-supported forces taken and interrogated and murdered and cut up into pieces and his body dissolved in acid. Another front that was very far away from Berlin, but still symbolized the division globally, like Berlin symbolized the division in Europe and in Germany, happened in Vietnam or in Indochina. Early before the Vietnam War became the Vietnam War, you see here Ho Chi Minh with some American officers who were part of what was known as the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. This was the forerunner of the Central Intelligence Agency. These American officers had been working with the Vietnamese, Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese during World War II, uh, fighting against the Japanese. The relationship eventually, of course, soured, and the division between East and West in Europe, in the Caribbean, in Asia, in Asia that manifested in Korea, that manifested in Vietnam. Again, you could always draw it back to Berlin, the symbol of that global division. Now, let me share with you a personal, just a brief personal story about a military operation that I went on called Operation Northern Wedding Bolgard. This is in the mid to late 1980s that just for me emphasized the importance of Berlin. As I mentioned, we were told always that if we, if we were gonna to go to war with, they called him Ivan. In the Marine Corps, they always called the Russians Ivan. 
If we were going to go to war with Ivan, it would be one of two places. Berlin, a massive land war in Europe because of Berlin, or a massive land war because of an invasion in Norway. The army operated all the time making sure that the defenses and security in Berlin were held down. But what about Norway? You see from this map right here that Norway, next to Sweden, and not that far from Denmark, if you Norway is to the north of Denmark and not that far from Germany. And Norway and Northern Norway and Russia share a border. So it was very much believed that if the Russians were gonna come through and invade Western Europe, two, two possibilities, Berlin or Norway. So in the mid late 1980s, I participated in a war exercise, a war game, military operation called Operation Northern Wedding and Bolgard. You see here another map showing Norway, look at how close it is to Germany. It would not take, it would not take much at all for a major Russian thrust from the north going south on the north-south, north to south axis to take over Norway, move into Denmark, and it's a very short journey into, into Germany. I spent a good number of time, a good number of days on a ship called the USS Inchon. It's a helicopter aircraft carrier. It also carried troop transports, amphibious assault vehicles. And early, early on in their operation, we got aboard these aircraft called the CH-46 or uh, the Chinook helicopters. We landed in Norway. We did heliborne operations. You know, we were doing all these things, all this flying around and operating on the ground. But we also deployed onto these aircraft, got on the onboard ship, flew off, of course, flew back to the, to the ship. This is full blown military operation. Also, we used the CH-53 stallions. These are the heavy duty, heavy lift hel helicopters that the Marine Corps was using. And to be on board that ship in the Norwegian Sea and to have these operations going on all the time. So we would fly from the ship, land inland, set up an LZ, just like it was actual operations. They take off, then we get picked up, then taken back out to sea. We had also the Huey Cobra gunships flying escort duty provided by these gunships to protect if in fact it was a real environment to protect us as we were flying to and from the destination points. These are powerful helicopters, powerful weapons, highly effective. We also were supported by fixed wing aircraft called Harriers. These are what they call VSTOL aircraft, vertical short takeoff landing aircraft. So you had all these tools out there. I won't stop here for the, to talk about the Harrier, but what happened at one point to show you just exactly how dangerous the Cold War was. And when I'm, I'm telling you this because this kind of thing that I'm about to share with you, this happened so many times during the Cold War. Don't forget, the Cold War was the war that we couldn't afford to fight or else it would have meant the possibility of global annihilation. However, there were always, we were always probing and poking and the Russians were always probing and poking us. And on this one occasion, during this operation, the Russians decided to probe and poke and they did it with this thing called the Bear Bomber. This was a long range reconnaissance bombing aircraft. It, it was nu nuclear capable. And the word came across one day that a Soviet Bear Bomber was shadowing the battle fleet. Now, again, these things are long range aircraft. They can stay aloft for hours and hours and hours. And they were, they were a frontline weapon at the time that the Soviets had. They were nuclear capable. So these were definite potent pieces of power. The word came across. Once we got word that we were being shadowed by a Soviet bear bomber or Soviet bear bombers, we were told to go to general quarters, which if you're in the Naval service, general quarters, especially here, when you hear this, the alarm goes off on board ship. If you hear general quarters, this is not a drill. When you hear this is not a drill, that means one thing. It's the real thing about to happen. You are either in trouble and at war or about to go to war. We, we got our weapons, our ammunition. We were told to get ready to get on board the helicopters and stand by. The next thing we heard was that F-14 Tomcats had been launched to go intercept these bear bombers. 
Let me show you what I mean. The F-14 was one of the most high-powered, complex, effective, sophisticated weapons of the 1980s. It had a variable geometry sweet wing that made it truly a marvelous aircraft. So they launched the F-14s and they went to intercept that bear bomber. We were on standby. The helicopters were spinning up their rotor blades on top of the USS Inchon on the flight deck. We had our weapons on standby. We were all, we had distributed ammunition, food, water, everything. We had no idea if this was gonna be just a drill. The F-14s went, it, they got launched, they intercepted the bear bomber and we were there waiting very tensely for a long time until finally, just as this picture right here shows, these two F-14 aircraft escorting a bear bomber out of the way, the word came for us to stand down. The bear bomber was escorted away from the battle fleet. To tell you that we, that we exhaled a sigh of relief is to put it mildly. Now look, let me be very clear. I have never been in actual combat. I trained for it a lot, but this happened on more than one occasion when I was on active duty, where training for it got real close to the real thing. To our veterans out there that have been in actual combat, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I remember thinking that day that if this, if the real thing is anything like this, the tension, the fear, the apprehension, I had nothing but admiration for those that have gone through the real thing. But again, the Cold War was hundreds, thousands of little confrontations like this that all added up to a 45 year standoff that always involved some way, somehow Berlin. We always came back to talking about Berlin. The wall was always there. It symbolized the problems, the inability to reach agreement, the fears of nuclear uh, annihilation, the strategic arms talk, people who hurl insults at each other from, be from behind either side of the Iron Curtain, the suspicion, the rivalry, the violence, the confrontation, the spy activity, all symbolized by the Berlin Wall. On June 26, 1963, President John F. Kennedy went to Berlin and made a speech. Freedom is indivisible. And when one man is enslaved, all are not free. All, all free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the words, Ich bin ein Berlin. Think about that. What, think about what that must have meant to the people of that generation. President Kennedy said, where there's a situation where one woman or one man is a slave, then all women and men are slaves. And then he said the entire world we're all Berliners. What the people of Berlin are going through, we're going through. The fight they're fighting, we're fighting globally. Berlin came to mean so much more than just a city with a wall. In the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you know, we think of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. as being this great civil rights warrior, and he was a great civil rights warrior. But in 1964, September 1964, he went to Berlin and visited the Berlin Wall. 
And as indicated here, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was invited to Berlin. Look, he is invited by West Berlin Mayor Willy Brandt. King visited the wall on September 13th at the border at the Potsdamer Platz in West Berlin. And then in October 1964, you see this picture right here? A mass escape of 57 people in October 1964 from East Berlin through a tunnel to the cellar of a former bakery in Bernauer Street, West Berlin. They dug a tunnel. Do you get the impression that people wanted to be free? Of course they did. So there's the actual symbol of Berlin as this larger global struggle between East and West, Europe, Africa, Central America, the Caribbean, South America. And then there's the more specific struggle of people in East Germany trying to escape the freedom in the West and the risk that they took to do it. And as the years, and as the years drew on, and Berlin continued to be divided by the wall. People just got used to it. Graffiti showed up. And of course, people were arrested by the Stasi, the German secret police. But there came a moment during the administration of President Ronald Reagan, where just as President Kennedy had gone to Germany and spoken about the wall, so President Reagan did during his administration. Now the Soviets themselves may, in a limited way, be coming to understand the importance of freedom. We hear much from Moscow about a new policy of reform and openness. Some political prisoners have been released. Certain foreign news broadcasts are no longer being jammed. Some economic enterprises have been permitted to operate with greater freedom from state control. Are these the beginnings of profound changes in the Soviet state, or are they token gestures intended to raise false hopes in the West or to strengthen the Soviet system without changing it? We welcome change and openness, for we believe that freedom and security go together, that the advance of human liberty the advance of human liberty can only strengthen the cause of world peace. There is one sign the Soviets can make that would be unmistakable, that would advance dramatically the cause of freedom and peace. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, Come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In the 1980s, in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, ended up being one of the most famous statements uttered by an American president in the latter part of the Cold War. It was 1987. He made that statement at some place called the Brandenburg Gate. And let me try this. You know, I've been talking about what the Berlin Wall symbolized. Just like people have always said that the American Congress and specifically the US Senate symbolizes it's the world's greatest deliberative democratic body. And it symbolizes more than just passing bills and legislation. Of course, that's what they do every day, but it's what it, has, it's what it means for our Republican democracy. It means what it means for people around the world when they see American democracy either working or struggling or occasionally not working. It sends a signal to other people about what they can do. If we are the pinnacle of what's supposed to be the best about how a democratic, Republican democratic society operates, 
People are taking their cues from us, whether we want to know that or like it or not. Likewise, the Berlin Wall, the Brandenburg Gate, where President Reagan made that speech, because you all, of course, are smart enough to know that where a president goes to make a speech someplace, they don't choose these locations by accident. The Brandenburg Gate, where Reagan made this speech and saying, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, it all was designed to symbolize the importance of the wall and to give a maximum meaning to Reagan's words when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, if you're serious about the reforms you say you wanna make, if you're serious about the reforms in the Soviet Union and getting along with the West and the freedom that you say you cherish, tear down this wall, all of it. The pageantry, the, sim the symbolism, the choice of location, all added up to a powerful statement. Look, by the late 1980s, the global, the global fronts that the United States was on was not just between East and West, but between, as this map shows, the global North and the global South. That global South included Africa. And particularly with regard to one individual named Master Sergeant Samuel K. Doe. I won't dwell on this. Let's just say that Master Sergeant Samuel K. Doe in 1978 had come to power through a coup staged in West Africa, the West African nation of Liberia. Uh, American foreign policy from, let's just say, well, the 19th century forward had been at best questionable and most of the time pretty miserable. In 1969, President Henry, President Richard Nixon, as indicated here from this, state, this statement, the late 1960s, the often fragile relations between the US and Af nations in Africa were summed up when President Richard M. Nixon meeting with the National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, and Secretary of State William Rogers said the following. Henry, speaking to Ken Kissinger, let's leave the blank in words to Bill and we'll take care of the rest of the world. So Africa was this, this last thought of priority for the Nixon White House as far as a foreign policy priority. However, in Liberia, Liberia was this American outpost set up by Black people who had left America in the 19th century to go back to Africa to establish a nation where they were, they, they were told and so they were sent to have a, a fair shot in life since it was believed they would, it would never happen in America. Their flag is red, white, and blue to this day with a blue field and a single star for the state. The capital of Monrovia named after James Monroe, the fifth president of the United States. Abraham Lincoln recognized the nation diplomatically in 1862. And then during the Cold War, Liberia was another nation that came to symbolize the divide between East and West. And it assisted the Americans during the Cold War to something called the Voice of America. In Liberia, there were, tele there were telegraph, there were rather radio and antenna stations that broadcast information inside of the Iron Curtain. Now, Master Sergeant Doe came to power in 1978. And one of the ways that he got rid of all of his opponents or his competitors was he took him out to the beach and put him in front of a firing squad. America eventually recognized Master Sergeant Doe. He became an, a loyal ally. He had a relationship with the, with the Defense Department. This is Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger with, with Master Sergeant Samuel K. Doe. Look, all of this just to show, to show that the divide between East and West symbolized by Berlin, it didn't have any kind of limitations internationally. So because Liberia, as brutal as Master Sergeant Doe was, if he signed on to be an American ally, we overlooked his atrocities at home that eventually led to the Liberian Civil War, but everything still flowed back to Berlin. And the changes that began happening in Berlin, we talked about some of those changes in our last session relative to the Artvark, and those changes eventually produced the leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev was the one who had his policy of perestroika and glasnost. He wanted to reform the Soviet system. He began to relax some of the, some of the, the very, very restrictive policies of the Russians and giving people more not opportunity, but more opportunities to free them to express themselves. His partner, 
his competitor and his partner trying to make the world, we hope, safer was Ronald Reagan. And you see here in this Time Magazine cover, Gorbachev was quoted as saying, the situation in the world today is highly complex, very tense. I would even go so far as to say it is explosive. The Berlin Wall was not long from falling. And in the midst of all this, in the midst of all this, remember this, the Challenger disaster, 1986, where an entire shuttle crew. I don't have time to show you the video and go into all the details, but it's just another one of those many things that an American president has to do. Sometimes it's the most hurtful, painful thing, but as a national leader, a leader, this is what they do. That disaster happened in 1986, but the issue of the Berlin Wall still persisted. Then there was another shifting front. We mentioned that as the 1980s wore on, Daniel Ortega and his advances in Nicaragua were also generating fears about communist influence in the Caribbean and South America. And again, people looked toward Berlin. 1988 was, a, was an election year. And that year, Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush ran for office and won. And toward the end of the 1980s, finally, things began to happen relative to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Remember when I mentioned that when the Russians invaded, that some people were saying that they apparently had not read this prayer by Alexander the Great, one of the greatest conquerors in all of human history, who said, may God keep you away from the venom of the cobra, the teeth of the tiger, and the revenge of the Afghans. The Russians probably did not get that note because in 1988, just as so many other people have done, the Russians, as illustrated by this political cartoon, the Soviet Union exits a boxing, a boxing match with the Mujahideen saying, good luck as a warning to whoever is fighting the Mujahideen next. In this case, the Soviets were giving up the struggle in Najib, to Najibullah, the president of Afghanistan at the time of the Soviet withdrawal. The Russians have been there for eight years. People called it their Vietnam. The shadow of Vietnam still heavy on people's minds. And in 1988, 1989, the Russians began withdrawing. As you can see here, these Russians and these armored vehicles crossing from Afghanistan or out of Afghanistan back toward the Soviet Union. Changes were happening fast. You see right here, isn't it amazing that no matter who they are, where they come from, a mother welcoming her, welcoming her soldier son home, it always looks the same no matter who they are. She's just happy that he's alive and glad that he made it out. Look at the tears of joy and this guy's happiness upon seeing his mom. For the Soviet Union, Afghanistan proved extraordinarily costly in a number of ways. You know, in a certain way, you could almost say if you could just swap out words for the United States, Vietnam proved extraordinarily costly in a number of ways. The Soviets never released official casualty figures for the war but US intel sources estimate that nearly 15,000 Russian troops died in that conflict. Also, the economic cost to the already struggling Soviet economy ran into the billions of dollars. The Russians did not have the ability to wage war on a multi-front basis like the United States. The reason why I mentioned to you all the five fronts, the Caribbean, South America, Berlin, Africa, Europe, the United States, our power was in more than just our military. Of course, we're militarily powerful. But the other thing that Reagan, that Reagan, that Reagan began doing was a troop buildup that forced the Russians to spend. They have a centrally planned economy. It's communist. It's inefficient. It was never going to be as nimble, as agile, as productive, or as powerful as the American economy. And then they're, they're sinking so much blood and treasure into Afghanistan as well. And then there was Berlin and the wall and the reforms inside of the Soviet Union. And because Mikhail Gorbachev was causing reforms inside of the Soviet Union, he was allowing reforms also throughout the East Bloc and the Warsaw Pact nations to include East Germany, which included East Berlin, which meant that people by 1988, 1989 were clamoring for the Berlin Wall to come down, to remove that last symbol of oppression and division and slavery 
in the East. And it eventually would. And George H.W. Bush would go before the Congress and declare that the United States with the fall of the Berlin Wall had won the Cold War. Dear civil society scholars, I know you all remember seeing him do that. I know you all remember hearing the president and the sigh of relief and it was, it was before a joint session of Congress and people began talking about a peace dividend, but we won the Cold War. We owe a debt of gratitude, immeasurable gratitude. The generation of people that fought in Korea, the generation of people who fought in Vietnam, the generation of people who were there when the Beirut Embassy was bombed in 1983 and the, and the airport bombed also. These people were the, all the gatekeepers. And then that last set of gatekeepers from 1975 to 1988 to 1990. But even though the Berlin Wall fell, there was still some work to do. We'll talk more about that in our next section. Thank you, everyone. Before we start the questions, I'm going to apologize. My computer crashed just as we were starting the program, and that's why I disappeared. And so I apologize to everyone for the inconvenience of that, but I was able to go find another computer and log back in. <laughs> and so technology is great when it works, but man, when it decides your computer decides to crash at the last moment. Um, so I was glad that the program went on without me. Uh, before we get into the questions. I just want to thank our sponsors for this evening. The, um, the Birch Foundation, a wonderful family foundation that believes in education. And we appreciate them as well as we appreciate Blue Lake for their wonderful media support for us. Now, um, I ask anyone that has any questions for our wonderful presenter tonight, um, please to um, ask away. Please unmute yourself and ask away. Cliff, you look another, like you're ready for a question. Another great job, Fred. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. Thank you. I appreciate you. I'll make a comment. Yes. When 1986, when I was in uh, in Panama, in the jungles of Panama, children were running around with uh, uh, Atlanta Hawks and Chicago Bulls T-shirts on. Yeah. And I asked, where where, did, where were they getting this? And what the, the response was the uh, the kids were getting it on TV deep in the jungle. They, the uh, couple of hours that they got TV was uh, uh, the basketball games were very popular. Each kid wanted to grow up and be a basketball player and make some money. Yeah. But the idea was they were getting this, uh, the Atlanta Hawks and the Chicago Bulls off the satellites deep in the jungle. Right. A couple of years later, uh, maybe uh, 80, 88, I attended a, a briefing that included the remark that the satellites are putting pictures behind the Iron Curtain. And the result of that was the uh, these pictures, the people behind the Iron Curtain that didn't have a car right. see people in the West that have two cars in every garage, a chicken right. in every pot. That's right. And the question was, why doesn't communism give me that? That's right. And uh, that was one of the sparks, uh, you know, just to be brief, that was one of the sparks that uh, affected uh, by the time that Reagan was uh, uh, visiting, visiting uh, uh, Gorbachev. Yes. The, uh, the movement, Gorbachev had a, it seems to me, he had a choice. He could be like Khrushchev in uh, the 60s and put down the, uh, the people, the people's desires. Uh, Gorbachev was more amenable to um, uh, go along with uh, tearing down the wall and uh, and uh, yes. change, changing the economy. Well, that's that's. And you know what, Cliff? That that you know, I didn't even have time to measure. I did. I didn't want to take time tonight, but uh, I can, I can revise what I'm going to do the next time. We didn't. I didn't even mention what was going on. You know, so much of what Gorbachev was doing was a because he wanted to do this, but also at the same time, he kind of had no choice because, you know, by this time, remember that what was going on in Poland with Lech Walesa and the Gdansk shipyards? Yes. The people, now Poland, 
was is you know was a big is a big country, and when those people at the Gdansk shipyards began talking about you know uh, the solidarity movement, uh -huh. they essentially took the initiative for their own country. And if you have a major country in the East Bloc like Poland that's saying like, look, yeah. we want to be independent, it was only it it wasn't not inevitable, but it wasn't surprising when Romania and Hungary and the rest of them followed. Now we know that there was Ceausescu in Romania, who when yeah. he finally was taken out of power, the the scale of the evil that he had been committing in his people just just you know just left people's eyebrows smoking. <laughs> but but nevertheless, you're so right. And the reason why I went, what, the reason why I mentioned Cliff that part about the Voice of America radio station in Liberia. Yes. Because I spent a month in Liberia at that VOA station in Carysburg, just outside of Monrovia. Okay. And you're right. The only job, the only the only thing they did was broadcast Western news and sports and information behind the behind the Iron Curtain. Yes. So it was it was some people call it a propaganda war. Uh -huh. Some people call it a news blitz. But it was to show people in the East who otherwise wouldn't have known. Here's what's go. going on in the West. You got it. Exactly right. And I, I also spent a month at the, the Uber Rocker station just outside of Munich. You know, and the, the strange thing there, just very quickly, the strange thing there was that a German technician one time showed me they, they were still using the same radio equipment that had been used by the Nazis by Joseph Goebbels. It's uh -huh. just after World War II, the Americans took over that station. A guy opened up a big, big radio broadcaster broadcasting piece of equipment one time and showed me they were still using tube technology. <laughs> yeah. And the Germans, of course, being very frugal, say, hey, this thing is still working. Why replace it? Yeah. So they were using a piece of tube technology from yeah. a tube radio uh, with tubes that had been manufactured in Czechoslovakia in 1938 that had the swastika still on them. I thought, <laughs> you can't be, you can't get more ironic than using <laughs> Czech technology from 1938 with swastikas to broadcast American propaganda behind the Soviet Iron Curtain. <laughs> That's great. That's history. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> right. I never forgot yeah. that. Well, you made you made a lot of good points today. That's, Thank uh, you. Very very good. Very good to hear. Do other we have questions? any other any other questions this evening or comments? Next week we're going to have a slightly different topic. We're going to talk about the American military post Vietnam to 9 11 and the differences that occurred because we had went from an all to an all volunteer army and military from a draft situation and the differences that we encountered in the type of military that we had. Um, I think the parts that I saw tonight of tonight's lecture were exceptionally good and I appreciate. Fred for picking up the ball and running with it when um, everything went, you know, <laughs> went a little crazy. And um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email them to Teresa or myself, and I will um, make sure that Fred gets them and we can address them at the beginning of next week's lecture. And thank you again, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Scholars of the Silver Size has been. Wonderful being with you all again this evening. I look forward to our next session. See you later. You are so prepared. Right. Thank you. Thank you. He, he was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs>